Welcome to a special edition of the CEC Report. It's June 8th and I'm Robert Barwick and I'm joined again by CEC Leader Craig Ishwood. Welcome Craig. Thank you Robbie. Okay, in this week's edition of the CEC Report we have one subject. Special Economic Report. Australia's economic collapse is like a slow nuclear war. And what we're going to preview is what we'll be publishing next week in our New Citizen newspaper, which will include a feature of the Australian economy, which we've headlined, Slow Nuclear War, the British Empire's Destruction of the Australian Economy. We wanted to do it this week because this is the week that the Bureau of Statistics announced the GDP growth figures for the March quarter. And if you've watched the news, you would have heard Wayne Swan crowing about just how great they are. Um, our GDP growth was 1.3%, Craig, for the March quarter, which puts us on track for um, over 4% growth for the year. And it's something like double the um, closest co economy to us in the um, OECD. So Wayne Swan's carrying on. And it struck me, one of the things he said, though, was really uh, amusing. Because he said, these figures should give all Australians a, quote, spring in their step, Craig. And I thought, well, obviously he means as the Australians are on their way to the unemployment agency, they should have a spring in their step. As they're on their way to their 10-hour hospital queue, they should have a spring in their step if they're walking properly. Or as they're on their way to catch a train that's probably late, they should have a spring in their step. Because why wouldn't you be happy at a, at a statistic of 1.3%? Um, now, in all seriousness, we have a message to Wayne Swan. It's hard to have a spring in your step when you have a millstone around your neck. And the real story of the Australian economy is a horror show. And we've called this slow nuclear war because, you know, there's nothing more dramatic than a nuclear bomb. It just obliterates everything instantly. Well, imagine that process slowed down 30 years. And that's what's been done to the Australian economy. So, Craig, I'm going to hand over to you and you can lead this because you've done the work Craig's put in a lot of hours in the production of this paper and he's prepared a huge number of graphs which we're going to go through which actually show what the state of the Australian economy is and before just and my message to the viewers is what you'll see from what Craig does is something that you'll all relate to because you're living it. Yeah. So what's the true story Craig? Robbie I think our viewers have to realise that we're associated with uh, Lyndon LaRouche, you know, statesman and physical economist Lyndon LaRouche in the United States and Mr LaRouche is the only economic forecast with a record of actually forecasting every economic downturn that there has been in the last 50 years. Uh, Mr LaRouche you know, puts out regular forecasts, not predictions, but forecasts based upon the idea of physical economy. And I think one of the notable uh, forecasts was in May of 1987, LaRouche forecast that there would be a major crash on the stock markets, which indeed happened in in uh, October of 1987, and I have a couple of graphs here to show you know what the, the magnitude of those collapses were, and you know the 1987 one was the biggest collapse in um, history. I'm talking about 23 percent of the stock market collapse, over 500 points. Yeah, the point is though that Mr. Larouche forecast that. Well, how could he do that? How could Mr. Larouche in 2007, just days before Lehman Brothers collapsed? actually forecast it, which he did. He did that very famously in a, in a webcast just about three days before it happened. Now well, the point is that Mr. LaRouche looks at the economy not from the point of view of these statistics that are an afterthought. Statistics are a measure of dead processes. He's not interested in Wayne Swan's statistics. No, look, no. It, that, those statistics go back to March, Robbie. We're now in June, yeah. right? So, I mean, what's happened in the last two months? You could have the entire wipeout of an economy like you see in Greece or Spain or whatever, but statistics say things are good, right? It's a bit like having a traffic accident, pulling yourself off the, off the road, going home and watching accident on television to say, oh, it must have happened. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not real. Mm -hmm. Now, in 1994, to make it real to people, Mr. LaRouche actually developed a pneumatic, mnemonic device called um, his triple curve function, which is a very, very important function, Robbie, because it actually describes what's happening in the economy. And there's three curves in this triple curve function you'll see that there is a very important physical economic curve. Now, this is the measure of production of manufacturers of agriculture, of everything we actually produce, things that we consume, machine tools, the whole works. And you can see from this curve that it's falling through the floor. Mm. 
and it's actually accelerating as we speak right now, that the, the rate of collapse. But there's two other important curves in this graph, which don't exist in a healthy economy, and I'll say a bit more about that in a sec. But you have, of course, the financial aggregates. These are bonds, these are stocks, mortgages. These are the financial instruments that have been created in the deregulated market, and they're just piling and causing debt upon debt. When you look at the housing bubbles, for example, the creation of derivatives, collateralized debt obligations that brought the entire US housing bubble to a screeching halt, in fact, the disintegration. Right, you have these fictitious financial aggregates. Derivatives are another one, or we have you know, up to $17.9 trillion of these things in our Australian banking system. Because some, some financial aggregates are legitimate, but the, 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 when you see a growth rate in that blue curve like that, at the, and, and effectively at the expense of the physical economic curve, then that is the fi these fictitious values. Yeah, kicking. When you see that shape, like you're yeah. right. Now, the point is, if you have a look at a healthy economy, you'll see that there's only two curves. One is the, the green curve, or the physical economic output, which is going up, you know, not at a hyperbolic rate, but at a steady increase. Growing. And then you have the financial aggregates, because you still do have to have mortgage. You still have financial obligations to drive the physical economy, but the two are intimately linked. And they match each other. They're they supposed to match each they're other. They're supposed to shadow each other, actually. The, the financial aggregates are a, a tool to help the yeah. physical economy. However, when you have a monetary system like we have today, like the British Empire's monetary system we've talked a lot about on this show, you have a third curve, which is the printing and control of money. Not credit, but money. And what you have in LaRouche's triple curve function, you see you have a crossover point, which was the year 2000, which was the collapse of the uh, tech bubble in the United States in particular, but all around the world and, and as a follow-on, where they literally said to solve this problem, we have to crank up the printing presses yep. and literally created credit upon credit, money in order, and flooded the entire world with money to the point that today the bailout, for example, of the US system is something like 29 trillion dollars that Obama's been in, on top of. It started with Bush, but Obama's now on top of it. So what you've had is a crossover point, as I said, in 2000, and, uh, 2000 where the mo monetary aggregates absolutely shot up into a hyperbolic curve. Now, just because they go up doesn't mean it's a good thing. You've got to look at the one going down to see that that's actually representative of how we live. It's like someone's temperature going up. Doesn't yeah. It's not a good thing. Now, this is the tricky bit here because, you know, people... Well, hang on, hang on. We have to, we, we ha we're running a TV show here. Oh, Craig. okay. Sorry. So we're going to, th you've given us the background. We have to take a break here. When we come back, Craig is going to show you the Australian figures that and how they fit into that curve. <laughs> Welcome back to the CEC report. So Craig, just before the break, you explained the triple curve and this dichotomy between the physical economy and the growth in uh, financial aggregates and monetary aggregates. Now, how does that, um, how is that, that pattern on display in the Australian economy? Okay, well let's rip apart Wayne Swan's analysis of the economy, Robbie. We've got a two-speed economy. You've basically got a looting operation of our raw materials where if it's a mine, if you can dig it out of the ground and flog it off, then that's what's being supported. It's being supported by infrastructure, it's being supported by whatever is necessary to, to, to do that. And this is a policy that came out of the 1982-83 reforms under Keating, where he was very much supportive of the idea of Australia being a raw materials exporter, and that's it. So what you see in this graph, export of raw materials, is another hyperbolic curve. The orange one representing the, the amount of exports that we're actually shipping out of this country. So the economists would say that's, that's our um, uh, great accomplishment as an economy. That's what's kept us fl afloat during the GFC. Robbie, this is actually representative of the bottom curve in Lyndon LaRouche's physical economic graph because where are the value of the manufacturers coming from those raw materials? They're not there. That wealth, that actual value-added wealth is being literally shipped out of the country, whereas Australians are not but benefiting from it. And that's why in the 1970s, Whitlam, under the Rex O'Connor, wanted to have a policy called buy back the farm, which is why they were trying to get the credit and literally to buy back mining companies to, and, and to keep the resources, the mineral resources, in our country. Now, you know, what has this led to? The fact that we haven't de developed our own internal economy. Well, let's have a look at some of these other curves. And take note... For the viewers, take note, you've seen the, the shape of the resource curve there. Yeah, the they're all going to be very... Take note of the same shape in these following curves. They're going to be very similar graphs. But look, this is Australia's foreign debt. 
right? Is this a success story? No, this is a disaster. If you have a look at it, so it's you gone can from something like 23 billion uh, around 81 to 1.304 billion in the latest trillion. figures. Trillion. trillion. 1.304 trillion. 1,304 billion. So what you've got here is a, this is another measure of the collapse function. What right? you're building debt upon debt. This has got to be serviced under the current monetary system. So we're paying a huge amount in interest rates to mostly overseas uh, uh, lenders. Right, and consequently, that wealth, which should be in Australia's uh, economy, is being literally bled out. Our standard of living is on borrowed money, in other words. Yes. And and it doesn't look like Craig that the huge spike in our export um, of resources has done anything well, to lower <laughs> our foreign debt. That's yeah. Side by side, a success story. No, it's representative of a disaster because we're increasing the debt at the same rate as we're li ripping minerals out of the ground. And as I said before, it's all part of the speculative economy. Here you have, once we deregulated the entire monetary syst uh, mon money system and shut down the, the control mechanisms of the Bretton Woods system starting in 1971 and then began to liberalise and deregulate the banking system, it meant that the banking system became flooded by these things called derivatives. Because you had no control over the system now by lawful sovereign governments, it was basically the free market forces. So in order to cover the risks associated with literally opening up the market to whatever uh, uh, swindle is possible, you actually had to cover yourself. So they, they created these instruments called derivatives, which are basically like casino bets. So that they can cover the direction that the floating exchange rates go or the monetary uh, values of, the, of various currencies. All of this stuff, this floating exchange rate system, uh, you know, the... the uh, in capital controls that countries used to have have all been removed. So basically it's one gigantic global casino and right now Greece, Spain, Italy and all those countries, including Australia, are caught in the vice of this casino economy. And this graph in particular is really scary because we don't have many banks in Australia and that's just the, the derivatives that our banks are holding. So yeah. they are obligations that they have to pay if things go bad and of course there's no these way you are, can pay $18 trillion. These are called off balance sheet liabilities. They, they, they take a smidgen of these, a small proportion, stick it on their balance sheet, but they basically say the rest of the, you know, we don't have to worry about those. Can I just point out one thing before you go on for the, again, the sake of the viewer? Th this graph starts in 1989, and the important thing to, to, to understand historically is that once the world economy was deregulated from the end of the Bretton Woods system in 1971, it, the, the, the 87 stock market crash was actually the moment of bankruptcy of the world economy. The big growth in derivatives started after that because it was the derivatives where they basically, Alan Greenspan started and went around the world where they took worthless paper that had no value whatsoever and they derivatized it to create fictitious values and that's blown from about a trillion dollars worldwide in 89 to $1,400 trillion today. And so we've been living on a 20, more than a 20 year now bankruptcy of the world economy and it's, that's why there's no point, there's no recovery point as of now. Yeah, I want to go through some of the physical economic graphs now, Robbie, in terms of what does the, the actual economy look like? Well, let's take manufacturing, uh, the manufacturing sector. Now, if you have a look at this next graph, which I won't hold up, called them in manufacturing employees, what you find is that today we have less workers relative to federation. And it, back in federation, you know, we had... Um, well, we, we had you mean a century ago? A century ago, we have less workers today, or close to it, than we had a century ago. So we've lost that capacity. We have about 980,000 manufacturing workers, but only 500,000 of those actually have full-time jobs. There's a huge amount of casualisation and part-time work within our manufacturing sector. Are you saying a century ago in, a, in, in absolute numbers or as a percentage we had more workers? As a percentage, right? Because the point is that back then, I think the GDP was... Uh, uh, Today, the, the um, contribution to GDP is about, what, close to 9%, maybe 8%, similar back before Federation. Oh, okay. Right? Now, that's the, the way that... Um, so, we've, so we've basically gone undone all the, the, the industrialisation of Australia from World War II onwards, the, 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 like the three-decade period of World War II... As a deliberate policy. Newland. This is a deliberate post Paul Keating, Bob Hawke policy. And you see, as a result, our in effect, in import of manufactured goods has gone through the roof too. And this includes things like machine tools, cars, the whole works. You know, with the free trade uh, tariff barriers you know, being shut down, you're, you're basically destroying a car industry. This graph starts from around the time, just, just prior to the time when tariffs started being slashed 
under Keating and Ross Garno. Yeah, of course. And when you destroy your manufacturing base, you take workers out of higher, more higher paid jobs, what happens is you end up smashing the economy to the point that people become more and more debt ridden because they're not getting the jobs that they need. And this is reflected in, for example, credit card debt, which is again, in 1985, just skyrocketed up right up through the roof uh, to t 2012. Um, so that's one particular aspect for the physical economy, for the house, for the, for the people, the income earners. And this one's fascinating. This one is a real fascinating one. This is the household debt to uh, household income ratio because everyone points to the United States and the housing bubble over there about you know, how bad it was. Well, the fact is, people, here in Australia, it's worse. Our household debt to uh, income is much, much higher than in the United States. And we crossed over, we, we overtook America around 1997. So all this whole period post 97 in America, this is the, the um, subprime mortgage bubble. This is when Americans were loaded with this household debt that, was, that proved to be unaffordable. It all collapsed and they've collapsed with it. Yet ours has been higher the whole time. So therefore you have to ask the question, how is it the housing bubble is going to stay up when people can't afford to pay for their mortgages? Uh, and that is in fact another aspect of the collapse. All right, Craig, I think now's a good time to take a break. When we come back, we've got some more physical economic indicators, especially around the rural sector. Welcome back to the CEC report, this special edition on how the Australian economy is like having been hit by a slow nuclear war. So, Craig, we've started going through the actual you know, statistics of Australia's economy, all in contrast to Wayne Swan's precious little 1.3% GDP growth rate. Um, let's look at the state of agriculture now. Yeah, well, just to recap, Robbie, I mean, just before the break, we went through the household ratios where we showed personal debt, debt going through the roof, credit card debt going through the roof. Well, it's the same, of course, in, in, in our rural productive areas. Farmers' debt you know, has, has skyrocketed to $64 billion. It's, you know, trying to deal with uh, a free trade environment has meant that farmers have gone, uh, have been suffered under a policy called get big or get out in the last, uh, you know, 40 years, particularly again starting under the deregulation of the banking system. So our farmers are saddled with enormous amounts of debt trying to survive. And, well, and sorry to change the order, but you've got to contrast that to this next graph, which shows that the absolute number of farmers has dropped through the floor. Yeah, well, I did all the work on uh, trying to establish exactly how many viable family farms do we have in this country. And it's not easy from the statistics because the statistics are all inflated and they're all rubbish. And I think this is an example of you know, where Wayne Swan can puff himself up to rival puffing Billy. But the fact is the statistics have to be looked at from how they're collected. Now, if you take 19, uh, 2010, for example, they say there's, this is the language they use, 154,000 farm businesses. Now, you could be mistaken and say, oh, that's family farms. No, it's not. Because, uh, sorry, that was in 2006. Because in 2006, when the census came out, there was 102,616 family farms where people ticked the box and says, I'm a family farm. So you take that 154,000 figure from 2006, and today that same figure is published in the ABS is 134,000. 20,000 down already. Right, but that, that includes all farm businesses that have an income of over $5,000. Now, yeah, in case the viewers don't know, Craig, what, how successful would a $5,000 farm be? Oh, it's about, uh, at $10 a box, that's, you know, five, 50 500 boxes of tomatoes. I mean, how can you, you can't really make a living out of that. I mean, a car, Robbie, yeah, yeah, is yeah. seven times the amount. I mean, it's absurd. To count them as farms is a joke. It's a joke. Now, so what I said was, okay, well, even if we had a 15% profit rate to employ someone on the basic wage today at 30%, let's assume that we look at only those establishments that produce more than $200,000 gross income. And then you find that there's about 41,000 farms that or businesses that produce that sort of income. And I'm, I'm, I'm only taking 30,000. It actually costs double that to raise a farm, uh, to a family on a farm. So you're looking at 41,000 actually potential viable family farms. And anecdotal discussions with our various supporters in the regional areas, uh, Queensland, New South Wales, West Australia, support this, that you know to employ a farm Labour today costs the same as what it costs to employ someone in the mines. Now we know in the mines at seventy-five thousand to one 
150000 So you have to pay a farm labour that to, to be able to get that sort of labour. So that represents a collapse of our productive food potential. So the, so the, the 40000 or so we've estimated in real terms, would actually be comparable farms to the ones that in 1953, the, 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 the 204,000 farms in 1953 were real farms, yeah, real family, you, viable you family farms. You didn't have hobby farmers back then. You didn't have, you know, little tinkering on the size of rural areas, uh, uh, cities and so forth. Farms were farms. You could have cattle, you could have dairy farms. These were real productive areas. And it was shown, Robbie, by the fact that we didn't need to import as much food. Look, back in 1967, we produced, we, we imported 118 million uh, dollars worth of food. Today that figure has skyrocketed to 8.9 billion. You know, whole sectors have been shut down uh, and destroyed under the doctrine of free trade. This again, look at the shape of the curve. That's what I'm trying to get for people to look at, right? And in, in a sense... So our food security has been lost along with our family farmers because that's, that's where your food security comes from. Yeah. And there's the area of family farms, this is sort of intersects the whole shutdown of the Murray-Darling Basin area the idea of a lot more productive area being shut into uh, the wilderness areas and so forth, but literally also the loss of family farms. But, and, uh, yeah, and that's really striking because a country like ours, which has so much potential to be the food bowl of the world, what agriculture we've got, we've been actively shutting it down. Or, s or allowing foreign investment. 24% of the Northern Territory, Robbie, is foreign-owned land in agriculture. I mean, that's a really startling thing. No other country in the world allows their farming land to be owned by, well, others do, but here in Australia, it's relatively easy compared to places like China or Japan, where you can't buy land, you can't actually own it. And then, Craig, we, just to move on, because we're running out of time, I'm a bit concerned about the clock. A real measure of our standard of living, of a real healthy economy, is what standard of living do we have? Well, let's look at our hospitals. Well, the point is, Robbie, you've had a collapse of the number of hospital beds available to the population. And this very dramatic graph here shows it's come down from about 7.8 beds per 100,000 people. In 75. In 75 down to, you know, basically 3, 3.7, 3.8. And that includes psychiatric beds and so forth. That, hence the waiting list. Hence the expanding waiting list that you see. Now, getting figures on waiting lists is extremely difficult because all the hospitals lie. It's a state government dominated area. Consequently, they don't want to admit how bad their waiting lists are, so there's a lot of fudging of the figures. Only through the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare do they publish figures called median waiting times. And what they take is the time it takes for 50% of the people that are on a waiting list to get through their hospital system. And now what you see in this particular graph, that this, it, it too has collapsed, but the collapse is measured by an inverse function, an in, in, in increase. Now, Back in the year 2000, it would take 27 days to get through 50% of the waiting lists. Now, it doesn't mean that people are on the waiting list for 27 days. It could mean they're on the waiting list for mm. two years, but it, that's how fast the hospital takes yep. to get through them. That's now jumped up to approximately, well, actually 36 is the published figures. So this is a measure of the collapse of the system. And without throwing a huge amount of money, a huge number of resources into employing more doctors, opening up more hospitals, and increasing the capacity of the hospitals, with an increasing population, this is in fact a deadly uh, collapse function. And of course the reason we can't do that is because we're, the, as the other graphs show, we are physically bankrupt. Okay, that's it for the, the special edition of the CEC report on the economy. As I said, we'll, we're publishing this this week, this coming week, in our New Citizen newspaper. People need to see these figures, we need to get them out there because there's so much lies coming through the government and the media. So what I urge everyone to do, contact us either on the internet over the phone, order your copies in bulk. We're doing 250,000 getting around. Run out of time. Thanks for tuning in. See you next week.